All right, cool. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here. I think this is my second time here. Um, always exciting, a little bit nerve wracking, but um, yeah, I've been at Pinterest for five and a half years uh, working on computer vision and consumer visual search products. And today I just wanted to share some of the lessons we've learned and also how to, um, hopefully after the talk, you'll know how to build your own visual search systems. Um, so yeah, that's the presentation overview is that I'm just gonna talk about Pinterest very briefly. Like, what do people use Pinterest for? And where does visual search uh, have a role in Pinterest? Then I'm gonna talk about the different products that we've built. Uh, then go into the architecture of the entire system, how the actual retrieval and overall architecture works. And finally, I'm gonna focus in on, I think, the core part of visual search, which is how do you use deep learning to learn visual similarity? Cool, so Pinterest. Uh, so Pinterest is a visual discovery engine. And people come to Pinterest to discover ideas, like what I'm going to wear to work, or how I'm going to decorate my home. People come to Pinterest for so many different ideas, um, whether it's, you know, what recipe am I going to make for dinner today, and something more recent and also important to me, like how I'm going to plan my wedding. Uh, for some. But Pinterest essentially is a collection of ideas, and what ideas mean to us is really a feed of pins, uh, pins are mostly images, so people usually see a feed of images, but it actually has much more. So a pin is a bookmarklet. So people from other websites save content onto Pinterest, and they use the image as like the thumbnail for their content. So a pin is an image. It's also some text description about it. And it also has an underlying website. But what's really cool about a pin is that a pin represents someone's idea. Um, what that means is that people save pins into collections called boards, and people save pins for different reasons. Um, for this kitchen, someone might save a pin, this kitchen pin, because they really like the cool blue accent of the various elements in the kitchen. Someone might really like the vintage style, but someone else might just like the kitchen picture for, because it has a fireplace, right? People have different ideas, people create different collections, and this type of data is really uh, important for us to give people great recommendations, to build really good search systems, and also for visual search, uh, where we use these image sets to train large-scale image uh, similarity systems. But yeah, the general idea of Pinterest is that we have this really important data set of pin, board, user, graph. It's essentially, it's a graph, right? So for a given user, they have multiple boards. Uh, different boards have different pins. And what's really cool is that the same pin can exist in multiple boards. And we have this data at like really large scale, like over 4 billion collections, over 200 billion pins. Um, I can't describe all the different types of things I've seen on Pinterest, but uh, we'll let machine learning figure out how to give the best recommendations. So cool, visual search. So visual search specifically, on Pinterest there's a lot of ways to surface recommendations and search uh, results. We have traditional image search, where you type in text uh, and you get image results. We also have recommendations, where we use collaborative filtering approaches um, to generate results. But visual search specifically um, is a suite of tools we've built to let users be more interactive with images. So on Pinterest here, I'm decorating my, I'm trying to figure out like, you know, what's a good dining room design. I really like this uh, chandelier. And I'm trying to figure out like, either where can I buy it, or maybe just learn more about it. Visual search allows you to search within the image. Um, and that's one of the things, actually, that's only one of the things it allows you to do. The first part, crop and zoom, is what I just said. For any image on Pinterest, you can search a part of it. So you can use a cropper. We also have detection to automatically find elements of interest. But the whole idea here is that you, you can press the, there's a little button on the bottom right of every Pinterest image, and you can use it to just play around find different elements within the image. Um, we also have Pinterest Lens, um, where the whole point of Pinterest Lens is to bring the Pinterest recommendations search systems into the real world. So users should be able to take a picture of anything they want and get Pinterest recommendations. Um, and also, people use Lens for a lot of different reasons, but another important uh, reason they use it is for screenshots. So people take you know, screenshots of different websites and they want to bring this external content into Pinterest, right? So Lens is all about external content 
whether it's camera, screenshots, or anything on the, your device. And something really cool that we've been working a lot recently is Shop the Look. The whole point of Shop the Look is that we want to make every image on Pinterest shoppable. Um, there's the whole image, so we can always find shoppable items for the whole image, but with computer vision, we can decompose the scene and allow you to buy uh, the look on Pinterest, right? Like if you have a look that you like, you can buy the individual parts, like the shirt, the pants. Um, if you have a living room that you really like, you know, one furniture item in it, we build technology so that you can do it. So what's really important about visual search is that it's not a toy problem. So we have hundreds of millions of visual searches per month. Uh, we have millions of users daily. Uh, so it's really important for us to make visual search fast, reliable, and also improve the accuracy. Cool. So how does visual search work? So the life of a visual search query. The whole idea for visual search is the input is an image. Here the input is the crop uh, of my image, and I want to return results really fast in real time. Um, so the core technical challenge is that for any two image, you want to know how similar they are. And you want to do this for the billions of images that we have in real time. So what is visual similarity? How do I define visual similarity? Well, given two images, there's a similar, uh, similarity function that I have defined. Uh, and how do I define the similarity function? So say, say that I already have a deep neural network, convolutional neural network trained to generate embeddings. An embedding is essentially a compressed numerical representation for the image. And I'll describe more how to train this model, but just say that we have it. Visual similarity is take the embeddings from two different images and compute a distance on it. And the whole point of what we train for is that we want the embedding space uh, to have it so that similar images are closer together and dissimilar images are far apart. So I just told you how to compute visual similar similarity between two images. But in real time, we want to do this for billions of images. How do we do that? So at Pinterest, we built an infrastructure called Peach. And Peach essentially uh, encompasses the whole lifespan of what happens in a visual search. The whole idea is that in the beginning, we take a query. And the query here is an image. And the first step, what we do is what I just described. You extract the embedding in real time. Um, and also here, we you know, get some other metadata, like the title, um, other, any, essentially anything to make our results better. The first step of visual search is the needle in the haystack problem, right? You want to go from billions of images down to maybe like the 10,000 most relevant images. Um, and here, the solution that people usually take is some sort of approximate nearest neighbor solution. Um, there's a lot of open source packages that can do this. Um, and Pinterest, we rolled out something ourselves. Um, but really, the problem here is that you want to go from billions of images down to maybe the top 10,000 most relevant uh, to the query image, of course. So now that you have 10,000 images, um, there's usually a stage called re-ranking. And the point of re-ranking is that you can actually do a much better job, right? Users only care about the top 10 to 50 results. And you want to make sure those results are super high quality. So you want to use as much signal as you can, given compute budget and time. Um, and here, you don't just use visual similarity, but you use the metadata. You use even more embeddings or more models. But the whole point is for those 10,000 results, spend some time to really make the top results better. Uh, so here, 10,000 results, you score them with a lot of signals. You get different scores, and then finally, you sort them based on your most confident predictions. Um, and you return the results to the user. And you have to do this really fast, right? So for us, we try to target 250 milliseconds. Um, and it's definitely doable. Um, and for every single visual search product we built, it's a really similar stack here. Like, it's always about extracting features for the query, doing retrieval, then re-ranking, um, and then you do some sort of aggregation at the end. Cool. So the last part is about learning visual similarity. I think this is the most interesting part because the infrastructure is pretty standard in terms of information retrieval. But what's really cool about visual search is that, or what's really hard about visual search is that your query is an image. And you have to somehow be able to reason about images. So I'll describe two ways to learn visual similarity. The first way is pretty common. And the whole idea is that there's a literature called metric learning, where the whole point is to learn that metric that we care about. So what does that mean? Well, say here we have uh, three images. And you know that you have, already have labels of what's similar and what's not. And this can be done through engagement data, or it can be done through just human labels. It doesn't really matter, but the point is that you already have relationships of images. 
So when you're training your model, essentially what you're trying to optimize for is that you're trying to make it so that the distance between the positive images, the distance between the similar images, are smaller than the distances between the images that are not as similar, right? And there's, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but it comes down to uh, something similar to triplet loss, where uh, you can form this loss function so that it, you directly target similarity, where the whole like, human-readable way of reading the triplet loss is that you want to make positive examples, similar examples, close together in this metric space, and you want to make the similar images far enough. So the other way to actually train these embeddings, which is I'm sure a lot of you might be more familiar with, is through classification, right? So like classification is essentially given an image, you want to generate like a text label associated with that image. Um, and what's interesting about classification is that there's always an embedding layer in the network, right? So for VGG, it can be FC6, FC7. For the ResNet architectures, it's always a pooling layer at the very end. Um, and what you learn for classification is that classification essentially is tries to, from that embedding, be able to predict the text label. So that embedding itself has to, like the model has to use that embedding to reason about semantics. And what you can see is if you plot the embedding through some sort of 2D projection, um, when you train the classifier, you can already see that the embeddings are clustered around semant semantics. Um, so here we see like text is clustered together, food is clustered together, vehicles are clustered together, and like different looks are clustered together. So when you train a classifier, you naturally get a feature representation that has, pretty good, um, has a pretty good metric space already. So the big question then is like, which one do you use, right? You have triplet learning, you have classification, and we wondered about this for many years. Um, and more recently, we did the due diligence of actually benchmarking against public data sets, like all the different ways that you can uh, train this embedding. Uh, and these are just like, this is a tech report they released on some four, uh, four common data sets for metric learning. And our, the TLDRR for us is that maybe you should try classification if you haven't to train your metric learning. Because we found that you can train a classifier to be state of the art on all these public benchmarks. Um, so that's what we do at Pinterest. We train uh, these metric, we essentially train these visual embeddings through classification. Cool. So I have one last thing to share with you guys, um, something that we also did pretty recently. If you th think about the visual search stack, I told you that we have pretty different products. So we have the crop and zoom, where the whole point is that we need this, this we need high coverage, right? We need the embedding to work for billions of images. We need to return relevant results for billions of images. For lens, it's all about camera image to Pinterest. Camera images, I can take a picture of my shoe. Uh, it's very different from the type of content you would see being saved into someone's collection. So we need an embedding that can essentially cross the domain shift between camera and Pinterest images. And lastly, for Shop the Look, the, the product is very exact. What we care about is exact product match, right? Our data sets that we collect, they're trying to optimize for exact product match. Um, so it's also a very specific type of similarity function. So when we, when we launched these products, um, the naive approach that we took um, is just train an embedding for, like, a train a different embedding for every product. Uh, it's the easiest thing to do, um, but what we came to realize is that our team is still, our team is pretty small, so we, we ended up, you know, focusing on shopping recently, but then sort of neglected uh, crop and zoom, and it ended up with, like, we weren't able to update or uh, update the old embeddings for, like, crop and zoom for, like, many years. So one thing we really tried to do recently is multitask, right? Like, multitask embeddings. Like, we want multiple similarity functions in one embedding. Um, and because we use classification as the way we train metric learning, it's very uh, natural to add, like, multitask, right? So what is multitask? For this given image, a single task is maybe just predict a category. But I want to predict more, right? I want to predict the, predict the style of this image. I want to predict uh, maybe the texture of this image. So this is just all different types of taxonomies, all different types of data that we've collected. Um, and you can do this to train like an embedding that can work for multiple tasks. But we actually have to take it a step, step further. We also have multiple data sets. The whole idea for, is that we have different data sets for different problems. Like for example, lens, we care about camera to Pinterest. Um, for shopping, we care about product images, right? Exact product match. So when we train our embeddings, it's not just multitask. We have different data sets. Every data set has their own tasks and we train everything together in this huge uh, model. Um, so this is also public, well, it will be public soon. It's part of the KDD uh, conference, uh, where we showed 
exactly how we train these multitask, multi data set models. Uh, and what's really cool about this is that we, we came to realize that Pinterest, uh, training this one model does better than every other embedding we've ever trained. And it's, it's not just the model architecture that's different. We actually tried train using, we tried to train the model with the single individual data sets and compared it to training the multitask uh, embedding. And essentially, the multitask embedding always wins. So somehow or another, using multiple, using one embedding for all our data is able to come up with an embedding that just does better than using any of the individual data sets alone. And this, essentially, we shipped this already, and it had really good gains in terms of our metrics. Like, we cared about, like, we care about relevance of our visual search products, and we can measure this through human judgment uh, using some sort of Mechanical Turk-like platform. And we also care about, more importantly, or also as important, our engagement metrics, right? How often do people, we call this repin, so save a pin into a board. How often does that happen? Um, how often does, yeah, how often does that happen? How often do people even repin? These are all metrics we care about for our core products, and we were able to do really well for our visual search. Well, we were able to do really well using our multitask model against all the metrics we cared about. So that was super exciting. Um, and yeah, and these are sort of handpicked, maybe better than, I mean, more drastic than actually is examples of why multitask matters. Um, I think one of the TL, like, conclusions we came to was that we were sort of putting restrictions on the products ourselves. So we say that these products are used for different purposes, but um, there's always overlaps, right? People using crop and zoom might crop on the product, and we want to make sure that works. Um, even though it's super rare, there are people like, well, this is my issue actually, but uh, <laughs> people do use crop and zoom on camera images as well. So it really made sense for us. Like it doesn't, like the overlap is still not too high, so these different products do have different purposes. But having a unified visual search infrastructure that can just naturally handle different types of scenarios was actually pretty important to us. Um, and yeah, having this one embedding allowed us now allows us to just try new model architectures and really enable sort of cross-product uh, innovations at the same time. Cool. And that's all I had, so thank you. <laughs>